petroglyphs on the black rocks in the desert up the edge of my city. On the right, you see a museum, a visitor center that's engaged with the connection of the landscape, the earth and dam, the landscape, the mountains of the landscape, trying to create a building that almost doesn't exist in your memory that is black and stealth in its character. I look at simple things of material and making. On the left of this image, we see the ordinary concrete block in a small religious synagogue. And I'm creating with very limited means with a very ordinary material the ability to create a greater sense of place. I was given the challenge by this young congregation of limited funds. I knew that I had to build in something simple. I'm always trying to take the ordinary, not the newest, most innovative, but the ordinary things we often forget about, and seek ways that you can reassemble them in extraordinary ways. And sometimes they have the bearing of the power of great memory. So in the right hand, the left hand image, the right hand image that you're looking at from the audience, is an important wall in Jerusalem that's important to that culture, the religion, those people, the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. Again, architecture and texture is informed by light. And every place has this reality as we sit in this room today of the light of your community. How the sun rises, how it appears to the clean, dry light of the desert, the way that light appears across the reflection of the water that surrounds Singapore. Every day is different. It was truly a magnificent thing yesterday day to see the storms come in. I was in one of the taller buildings yesterday having lunch, looking across all of the vessels and the water beyond with a big black cloud raced across in the sun. That'll be a memory I never forget in the community. Now I have the privilege of wandering various places, even Billings, Montana, but there's another place in America called Wyoming. It's one of our states. It has two national parks that almost touch each other, the Grand Tetons and Yellowstone. And I had the privilege to be invited there to create a library that resulted in a whole suite of buildings. But here we have the fantasy always of history as memory, but that's not really what memory is about. It isn't just about history, about happening, it's about people and circumstance. But it sort of sets a framework. We have a simple town that really exists because there's a road through it. It's a place between beautiful places. We have the idea of a town square that's marked by the antlers, the shedded antlers of the, the animal population that surrounds this natural place. The antler arches that identify the thing we live with the myth of the old history of who was once there. Now I find inspiration in things both man-made and natural. These haystacks on your left or something that inspired me in their sort of grandness of making, they surround this landscape, which I'm used to. And these forms of these snow-capped haystacks became the inspiration for the development of an office building. The man-made architecture of one of the lodges in the National Park became the inspiration for the use of logs to what a space might become in a contemporary work environment. Architecture is about the balance between the poetic and the pragmatic. It's always balancing these two things. Because architecture is this challenging art form that is just not about poetry. It's about the magic of proportion, scale, and capturing a sense of, of artfulness. But it's about making places that work. Work for our lives, work for our livelihood, and work for the communities that we make. Again, as I work, look at that landscape, in this place, a tree became an inspiration for how you would build a building as the look creating the new library. And again, the columns that would hold up that library literally became the trees placed exactly as they were in the forest of Wyoming, as they defined the living room for that community. It's a definition of a, a horizon. We all look at the horizon, whether it be across a vast ocean, across the landscape of the western United States with its mountains and its perfect skies. And how does a building meet the sky? The light from here, I'm hoping you can read these images somewhat from the back. But this is a library, a very sustainable library that was created at the center of my community, Phoenix, Arizona. 
It is a building that was inspired by the geologic formations that surround that landscape. So an amazing red sandstone mesa became the inspiration for a copper-clad library that spans a highway that spans the entire United States. It's a building that was ahead of its time before we were thinking as much about sustainability. But in every diagram of its existence, it's not only being aware of where the sun was, it was aware, aware of this thing that would happen 25 years later where we're all realizing there are limits to the sustainability of this planet. We all have to create an architecture and communities that are about that circumstance. Again, scale, the scalest element coming crafted into the landscape, I mean, into the heart of a building, playing with the myths and the memories of the community. And again, we look at the past. In 1861, the library was done in Paris, the National Library of Paris. And that became a benchmark for what the technology of its time, the function of its time, it was before computers were there, libraries used to be places where people were caretakers of knowledge. Today they are navigators of knowledge. So in creating a great reading room for my community, at the top of this building where all of the books of knowledge were stored, where people could come and study as a community, I chose to give the top of the building to the public that is the people of our city. Because in all of our cultures, it seems that the wealthy occupy the top. And the high rise of your city is in mine, Bankers and lawyers and very wealthy people that have the top porch in the city. So in making this democratic building for my community, I made the most important room in the library that of every citizen. Put the fastest elevators in the city to get to that top room and gave them the chance to dream about their possibilities through the windows of that building. It's a building where the roof floats on light. And while it's a study space, it's a place to have dreams, finding functions of where your life will take you. It's also a place that one time a year, on the summer solstice at high noon, much as the temples we've heard about in Mexico and other cultures, come to worship the sun and celebrate. It's a time when our community comes together, where at the point at exact perfect noon, there are long skylights on the edge of the room, over every column there is a skylight with a small transparent dot of light. And at that moment we meet and start into another hot summer in our desert. For the last 20 years since this building's been built, a thousand or two thousand citizens show up to celebrate the coming of a new season, a new place. Architecture has that power of memory and making. I've worked with strange places as well. Every city has a camp, a casino it seems like anymore, and that's another discussion. There's a place in Nevada called Reno, it's not the famous Las Vegas. They're known for this sort of deliberate, of this expectation of wealth. Again, places of people and activity, timely and timeless, as they become part of a collection that becomes a civilization that we all inhabit.